every year I keep so many X amount of sheep, whatever I decide, then I don't put blankets on them because you can't grow long fleeces in the blankets. So they're jacketed and some people think they'll be, they'll say, oh my gosh, isn't it mean to jacket the animals in this heat? But they're like windbreakers. They have to be able to breathe. Otherwise the wool will mold. So they have to let water in and they have to let it out both. Um, or it would felt them. So come under here and we'll walk through this little. And so like based on um, how good their fleeces are, that's when I coat them. Or if I know that I'm not going, I'm, that I'm going to shear them within a certain amount of time. But the first fleeces are the most valuable and the ones that are the best to be kept long. And only certain animals can do it otherwise, or, or they'll felt. So we'll go in here together and um, we'll have to get the sheep up. I, my dogs, I can't work without my dog. Lie, lie. Steady, time. Time, hey. Time, come by, come by. Lacey, wait. There. There. Hep, hep. Hey now, hey now. Hey. I'm gonna take them, they're pretty wild. The sheep are. I have a breed that's not, they're not, they're fine wool breeds. These are not fine wools. Fine wool breeds are very gregarious, which means they like to flock. These are not gregarious sheep, so they will, they'll like try to break apart and it makes it really hard on the dogs. So these are the lo these are longer fleeces. They look a little bit of a mess right here, but this will all blow out with a blower. But this is when you know these ones are probably a half a year long. And so I'll start to shear them either when I think that they're going to start felting, or um, or next year they'll stay on until next year. But this cottony look right here means that it probably won't. I'll probably end up um, shearing this one. But you can see that it has the lamb tips on it, which means they've never been shorn and the lamb tips often have like little curled ends little tiny little ringlets and that's how you tell and but some of them, these are beautiful pieces even in even in my heat these sheep are from you know they're an english breed and they um you know 80 degrees is about you know maximum for them and here it can get 120 but because they're they were raised here their set point their internal thermometer they can handle the heat pretty well this is a this is a um a Coriadale with Tasmanian genetics, and it looks really ugly here, his fleece, but underneath this, my t my, none of my sheep are tame, but underneath, you can see, like all the little tiny, you see it's got a blunt tip and how crimpy it is? Yeah. It's beautiful, this is, this is one of my favorite breeds right here, and they're so mellow. These are crazy sheep, these are not. Um, but my dogs, without my dogs, can you imagine? Your dogs are amazing. They make my life so much, I mean, they make it, people wonder, you know, I share all my animals myself and um, I'm not a very big woman. And, you know, these, are, these aren't even yearlings yet. And so, you know, they're, the adult they're size is sheep. like, they're like, you know, 280. They can be 280, <laughs> 300 pounds. I know, my, I used to work, I, I didn't get dogs until I'd been doing this for like, I want to say five years before I got dogs. I, and I was a lot thinner then because I had to rope them. I had to rope the sheep. Like it was crazy. And I remember when I was looking for a dog, I told the lady in um, Lacey, the one that, that had Lacey, I told her I was, I was embarrassed, but I said, I, you know, I have to rope my sheep. And she was like, oh my God, you need this dog more than, because this was her dog that she worked with. And she said, but you needed her more than I did because you were roping your sheep. <laughs> and that, get out. So, and then these are, these are of course colored, you know, natural colored onesie dales, but I love them. So I have Teeswater, Wensley Dale, and um, Coria Dales. Those, those are the breeds that I have. And um, the Teeswaters, you can tell that, then there are some crosses, but the Teeswaters have the mottled faces, like that one right there. And they're a very premium breed. I sell their fleeces. When they're long, if, they, if they're past 12 inches, about it's $140 a pound raw. And I can get about six, seven pounds off of an animal. So, um, and then of course, I make sure there's no vegetation in it and they're highly skirted, but, um, it's, it's like a very, it's a very in vogue. Long wools are very in vogue because they're easy to spin and, um, and they pick up dye just, um, just so amazingly well. Like nothing can rival them but mohair and silk. Mm -hmm. 
Um, mohair probably is my favorite fiber, except it doesn't have any elasticity, so you right. know it can be kind of limiting. Yeah. But it, it's it's and also finding good mohair, I'm sure you know, is not easy because you can't coat them because right. it felts because there's no oil. Yeah. You know you can coat you know wool because there's oil in it. Anyway, so that's that, and that's those are my dogs. Okay, dogs, that'll do. I'll do. I can sh I can share one if you want me to. I was I'm sponsored by Lister. I feel really fortunate because I'm just gonna say like, as far as shearing goes, you know, in in the UK or in Australia or in New Zealand, you know, shearing is a really big deal. Even skirters are like, you know, they're like uh, trained. Mm. Yeah. So for this, for some, for those type of people, somebody like me who just you know shears my own animals, it, it, it's like, it's like humorous, right? Because yeah. um, they shear like 300 a day, and me, I'm bragging at 10. You know. <laughs> I have to make. We're gonna have to. Can we move my stand? Let's just move my stand. Sure. Because it's so hard to drag the sheep because I have so many different pens. And what I love is like when someone will see this place, whether it's on the Nat Geo show or whether it's on my, um, on YouTube, what they'll do is they'll be like, you know what you should do? You should get a lot of like, um, stanchions and then, you know, it'd be so much easier, but you couldn't do that because my sheep are all separated. Yeah. It's like a horse setup. It's like a racehorse setup, but with sheep, but that works for me because I have, I'm able to separate, you know, different breeds and different sires with different ewes into different pens. So we probably, you know, well, the biggest pasture we have is like maybe, I don't know, a quarter of an acre. And um, my breeds, because there's such a bottleneck of genetics, they, they don't, they're not very vigorous and they are not disease resistant. And so like putting them on grass, people think it's so mean, you know, oh my gosh, how do you, they live without grass. Let me tell you, without grass, your things like barber pole are non-existent. And so um, it actually works better for them to be on dry lots. And to have, you know, it's expensive because I have to feed them. However, I get to control their feed, you know, really well. And I don't have things like, you know, um, bloat really very often. It, it, if I, if, if something bloats, it's like, it's a rare occasion. But so this, so anyway, so the whole point is, is that I have this mobile shearing stand so that I can just move the stand rather than the animals. Because if I, if I had to move the animals, it would it'd take so long. And, So did you guys build most of the fences and most yeah, of the... Everything, everything except for the house. All of this, like the studio and everything. Um, and you know, we were right in the racehorse business before we started. Well, I'm the one that got really into to, um, to sheep because I had had so many kids. You know, I have five children and um, four of them were born within the span of like six years. and. So they were small and I was afraid they would get in with the racehorses. Open a gate and she'd be killed. Yeah, so exactly. I was the, and I have, you know, like I have said, I have a master's and a bachelor's in animal science. So the, I was just trying to rack my brain, what kind of animals could we raise, you know, that, that would not hurt them. Yeah. And then since they don't have any natural defenses, sheep and goats, I chose sheep. And that's how I ended up making yarn is I picked a breed of sheep actually that it has the little long wool, the dready, dreadlocks kind of looking thing, because that was just the most, the prettiest to me, and that's how the whole thing started. And then I was like, what am I going to do with all this wool? Doesn't life take you in strange directions? <laughs> it, did, it really actually did. Because a lot of people get sheep because they were hand spinners. And mine, I didn't really care about hand spinning. That was just, a, you know, that was just something that I was learned how since my animals made this product. So they'll be really small and then you'll go to shear them and then within a month they'll start to grow. Really? And it's because they're using their energy to stay cool. Uh -huh. So it's like, it's really crazy. It's like, I just call it the bloom. They bloom and get really beautiful and 
Um, it's really hard because we're asking them to not only grow fleece, but to let to grow their body size and to keep cool, all of those things. And it's it, it you know, it's hard on them. It can be hard on them. It, the, what I noticed though, um, for a while I tried to feed at a gr grain sponsorship for many years, and they you know it was all pelleted food, and I didn't have is they did not grow as large. I mean, they would get to their gen genetic potential, but it would take many years. Um, and I, I didn't have a lot of twinning. And so then I ended up not having a sponsor and they, the company changed hands. And my, I started feeding grain and hay and they did, oh my gosh, so much better. So it actually was, it was a good thing. The, the first year without it, I had almost every single one twinned. And that just doesn't really happen very often in my, in, in the kind of situ, in the situation that I have based on the um, the heat. And when you're, when, and it's not just like keeping cool, but it's like when when it's really hot, you don't want to eat. This is where I keep all my, and most of them are now getting. The one thing I don't do is I don't, um, I don't sharpen them myself, but I just sent a, a bunch to the, to be sharpened. So, I mean, one thing I, I probably have as many combs and cutters as I do shoes, and that's like mm -hmm. hundreds of pairs. <laughs> All different shapes and sizes. I get my favorites, though. My favorites used to be these 13s with the flare, flare, mm -hmm. and now they're not. They're 13s. They're 13s that don't have a flare. Then the, the, those are mohair combs. I like these ones, but it's way easier to cut them. You know, the, the less teeth that they have, the, the easier it is to cut. So I always tell people, because people ask what I use, and then I say, don't use what I use. Yeah, don't use what I use because you can cut them really easily. You can hurt them, you can hamstring them. It's just better to be safe, like 22s or something. Every single, you know, things that have happened for me, I have found the opportunity myself. And you know, I'm a person that doesn't like to ask for anything, but when you're desperate, you ask. And so I needed a sponsorship for shears and I needed a sponsorship for feed. And I just asked and it's, crazy that I ended up getting it. And the feed sponsorship lasted for many years. It saved me, you know, about $35,000 a year. And then, of course, these, they gave me the station, they gave me the, this, the, the machine, the Nexus machine, and they gave me two hand pieces, and they gave me um, the machine and hand shears, you know, the ones that are just, the ones that you see most people use. Mm -hmm. the, and those are really good too. I actually really like those. And I use them like for crutching, like, you know, um, or, or like when there's wool blindness and mm -hmm. I don't have to bring them to the, then I can just bring this, the shears into the yeah. pen with me rather than have to drag the animal all the way out here. And since I've never used it, it's gonna be a whole different. He's about ready, he's not gonna do it good. We've got perfect timing because he didn't feed them yet. Oh, good. Yeah. We, yeah, we, I don't know, we feed twice a day. Um, and we, you know, feed them like horse quality hay. Yeah. Instead of, um, a lot of people don't. A lot of people will feed moldy and I just, I just won't. Yeah. Okay. Hey, dog. Time. Steady now. Lacey, Lacey. Hey, time. Steady, steady, step. Time. 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 Hey, hey. Stand. Um, and then I just go through and I have to find who is ready. And I have a lot that are like borderline. And so the, the, most of these, if I share right now, will be first time sharing. Like this little tiny one's probably going to be one. And then we'll get to see it blossom. <laughs> Tiny tot. Okay, dogs. That'll do. Here, that here, that'll do. Here. L Lacey here. Lacey here. Here, right there, right there. 
không bị chết thả nó đi thả nó đi thả nó đi lại lại I have to blow off everyone that I do. And they say it like, see when you when I you leave like they don't always look pretty, but it's better to leave the wool on them rather than take it like if you leave a piece and it's like half of a piece rather than take it off because it'll be there for next year rather than a second cut. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna grab your leg. Hang on, hang on, hang on. So I try never to do more than like 12 in a day because you know I'm not young and because I have to drag them and especially with the older ones and I try to distribute it like so that I have like. I do a couple of small ones and then a couple of big ones rather than, and it would be way faster if I didn't have to like blow them all off myself. And, and my best friend actually is zip ties. Because <laughs> then I don't have to buy, you know, too many of every size. I just make these ones, but it does look funny, huh? Some people put like elastrator bands, elastic bands, but I don't think that works very well because they break. Yeah. And these don't break. Okay, there's you. Your haircut, your new haircut. I know it looks funny, huh? It looks very. I think um, it's brilliant just because I know how expensive it is to have everything be specialized. Yes. To be able to retrofit it saves you so much money and time. I tell people you work with what you have. Yeah. And then because I have to do everything, like I skirt it here. I mean, the second time I skirt it is when I'm in the when I'm actually in the the studio packing it. So you know, like people have skirting, they'll have like skirting tables, which is essentially what I have as my dry racks. Mm -hmm. But um, what I do is I, so I'll have to find a bag because I'll put like all the skirting will usually go in one of these, which I can combine. What was left out here was skirting, and then I'll go through this and try and shake it out. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the long wool breeds, unless they've been on the animal for um for a long time and it's partially cotted, they don't come off in one piece. People expect it to be like a merino where it's so dense and these aren't dense. There's like, what is it? 1800 follicles per square inch on a long wool and like 2800 on a on a um, fine wool. And so, you know, they're so dense that they will stay together. Whereas, you know, these, even crossbreds, because this should be a Coriadale, which is a medium wool crossed with a long wool. And so medium wool still are pretty, can be pretty dense, especially the ones with the spina fleeces the ones I have and so I just go through and I you know usually you'd be able to it was all in one piece go and and this is like called the New Zealand um, pattern so it's it's like a standard pattern that you always do the same time wait over and over again
and then you flip it that way and see now there's the pelt. Like it would, it's almost like it's a whole sheet right here. See? So I can go through it and I can just grab it by sections. Like I know that I don't want the bridge, right? The bridge is not interested in and around right, right the, the neck because the blanket doesn't cover it so it gets vegetation. And so those parts I don't want. So I will take it and I will like roll it. Try to shake any second cuts off. There's not usually I'm pretty good about not getting very many because if I make a mistake, I leave it on the animal rather than try and make the animal look pretty and cut it off. And then it would just be a second that we would throw away. And then here you can see, you know, this part is negligible. It's a bridgey, bridge, more bridge. So the at the hind end of the animal was back here, and then when I flipped it, it's over here. And the bridge is like the side of the leg right here, and you can tell because it's really flat. So people a lot of time or don't. One of the tests for the master um, spinner certification from Olds College in Canada is like you have to take a fleece and know what end is what, and it's really not hard unless you have a super good merino because the, the bridge will always tell you. It's always, you know, it's never as nice except in really good merinos. So, and then I just roll it in sections. And because I sell by, I heavily skirted and by the pound. And so like, I, I don't sell whole fleeces to people. And then I don't sell usually to people I don't know. And I have a way, I have a pre-order for my fleeces. <laughs> so people get mad. Sometimes they'll write me and they'll say, how, you know, how do I become one of your customers? But like, like if you're gonna yell at me in an email, like that definitely isn't one of the ways. Cause you know, I, I, I really, I have a really, uh, a very solid, um, very solid amount of people that have been supporting me for years and I can't sell, you know, if they are buying all my wool, it's not fair to them that supported me in the dry times to then take on more customers and sell the fleece that they want to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I don't do that. I pre-sell to my, to the people I know. And if I was that I didn't have, if I had more then I would allow, I just would never, that would never happen because the people then would buy more. If I had extra than my customers that have been my long time customers would just buy, you know, more pounds. So it is hard to become one of my, usually the best way is, so what I do is I tell people that, you know, if they want to become a customer of mine for my raw wool, that the best way is to like either be in the dye course or buy scrap boxes and then I get to know you through that. Otherwise, um, you know, buying a, a raw wool for me isn't, I mean, isn't probably possible. This is so soft for being a long wool. I mean, honestly, I mean, even though it's a cross, but it's like, it's like down. It's almost like, you know what? You could almost think this was alpaca. You sent me some when when we were doing i think he sent me some when i got my scrap box that was for my live show with you yeah. and it was, was like butter i think yeah. he said it was cory dale a mix Feel this. it was a mix yeah it's incredible i mean that actually feels lofty like alpaca i actually when i was doing one of my um workshops in new jersey that person was an alpaca breeder and a bunch of people were alpaca breeders that took my class that that were taking the workshop and that they actually didn't know me and i um usually do a, a test not to make embarrass people but it's for their own just to show them how much they've learned from the beginning of class to the end like a marker right so i put a bunch of fleeces out on the table and the, none of them are marked and none of them are marked in my bags but there's like 20 of them and i laid them out and then i you know explain some characteristics about you know different categorizations of um wool and then i will put i will put wool that is like alpaca and i all the alpaca people Except for one, thought it was alpaca, but it was wool. But I had told him, I said, I'm not throwing a red herring. There's no red herrings. So they should have known that there wouldn't be alpaca if, if I was talking about wool. And, um, but the one way to tell, and the reason why I do that is because it's happened to me. And the way to tell if you ever can't, because sometimes there are alpacas that are really crimpy and they're just lofty and you're just like, there's no way that this is alpaca because of the crimp, you should get them wet. And the mm. one that dries the fastest is the wool. Really? Mm -hmm. It, it, and it, you know what I have to say is it, a woman at my age, like if I had to reflect on my life and think that, that I uh, didn't have a, um, an, an expert knowledge in something that I had dedicated enough time um, to, that that would be sad for me. And I think that everybody should, you know, I, I don't think you should be a jack of all trades. I think you should be an expert or a master as they say, of at least one. I'll, I'll dye a bunch of fiber. Not everything makes it in the scrap boxes. So I have so much left over. And that, like what I'll do is either at the end of the year, I do a de-stash and people will kill each other. <laughs> to, I mean, it's like becomes insane. So I'll do a de-stash where, you know, it's called seconds and thirds and fourths, right? And then, um, but like Trisha is, I love her so much. She's done so much for me that I, you know, I give it to people that I like because I'd rather <laughs> give it away to someone I like than sell it to someone who I don't know. I should probably put a smaller jacket on that little bit.
Okay, so so one one of the things that I do is like um, I will teach I teach dyeing, which is a huge component of my my business, and it's pretty extensive. And so um, that's where things like um, these the, you know pieces like this come in. And so they, these are just pieces of whole fleeces that I've dyed that I haven't pulled apart yet because they go into another component of my business, which are called scrap boxes. And it's it's basically boxes of fiber and um, and add-ins that people make handsman yarn from. And, but it's like a kit, essentially, so that people don't really have to think. It's like everything's in there that you could want in the same colorway. And I probably have 80 different colorways of scrap boxes. And then, you know, things like this or just, you know, I was teaching people how to dye um, uh, uh, finished objects in a certain way. And so this was, this was made in white and then was dyed into a finished object. And then um, these Nabori scarves. This is another aspect of my business. So I teach people how to dye silk and wool um, and it doesn't have to be scarves but those are just easily handleable and then here's more um, when I when I dye you know it used to be that people would people would you pull apart these locks and that's for me a silly way to dye it's you have way more control if you can leave them on you know um, the, in one big sheet and then like make an accordion out of it and dye it that way and so it's like, this is, I bought this. I wanted to see how someone, this, these people dyed this. I wanted to see how good they were. It's kind of a well-known dye company. And of course I could critique it all day long. But of course you want to see what people in the industry, even though um, I really truly believe that there, you have no competition, a person doesn't have competition. That um, we're really only you know, competing against ourselves, essentially. It's sort of like the inner game of tennis. There's a book called The Inner Game of Tennis, and it's a great book. And if, um, it gives you perspective, like, like truthfully, that um, it's all in our heads. And so for me, what I tell people is that if somebody is better than you in, your, in, in a field that you're in, you better get better better. And if you can't, you, you have to figure out um, another avenue. It can be in the same industry, but it has to be a, from a different perspective. But to never feel like um, that someone is outwitting you in your own business. That you have to be more crafty. And that's kind of where, and then if people can't be more crafty, then, then you know, it's just like there's passive people and there's aggressive people and maybe that the, per the person isn't aggressive enough. And in some industries, you have to be really aggressive. And to succeed, I mean, it does take a certain amount of, I guess it goes back to desperation, it loops right back. If, if you don't know how to manifest money, you're just not desperate enough. And that's really what happened to me. I, I'm a survivor and I think that, you know, there's something to be said. We like to pretend that we're not predators, but you really have to go back to like the etiology of us as, as human beings. And um, that survival instinct totally kicked in to where I, even though my husband had been the primary breadwinner before, he actually, you know, um, isn't as good at it as I am, but I didn't know that. And so once it was a great, it was a great opportunity for growth in our relationship too, that the roles were actually skewed. They were in the wrong place. It was like he was the money maker and I took care of the children and I'm a nurturer, but you know, not, I'm just not as good at it as him because he's more organized than I am and has a different skill set. My skill set, I didn't even know my skill set until we had no money. And then I was like, oh my gosh, actually I'm really good at this because I just never give up. I just am like a dog on a bone and I just think constantly of how I'm gonna manifest um, different aspects of my business. And one of the mistakes that I, real, that, that I really realized early on that people make and that I made myself is, I, I thought I'm going to tell people what I'm gonna sell and then they're gonna buy it. And then I realized very shortly thereafter that it's the people that tell you what they're gonna buy from you. And so you have to, you, you can't be controlling and you have to be very uh, dynamic and you have to be able to let go of an idea. So if an, if an idea doesn't take hold and people don't want it, then I let go of that. It doesn't mean forever, it just means for them. That's not what they want from me right now. Cause, and because my original idea was, well, I'll just sell my animals because they're highly desirable. And it's sort of like the way my husband explains it is how many people can buy a Ferrari? You know, they, in the dealership, they may sell one, each salesperson may sell one every three months, but how many people can buy a Volkswagen, right? So it's becomes, it's, it's about price point and it's about, it's about more than price point, but that's one aspect and, and colors and, um, and textures. And so, you know, this, you know, in the summer, obviously like a dark wool doesn't work really well, but you know, white wool that can be, you know, colored into jewel tones works really, really well. Whereas try and sell pastels during winter time. You know, it's that sort of a thing where you have to really be able to, to not 
be stuck on what you think people want. You have to really let them tell you what they want. And that means also having a variety of ideas. More. And then, um, like things like what I'll do is I will make a, so this is art yarn and a lot of people will, you know, um, not, not like art yarn, but in weaving art yarns are awesome. And so, um, the, the thing that's cool about art yarns besides the fact that I think that they have so much texture and so much color and you could never have a machine make this a machine could never make this. The thing that I like is that you're really honoring the animal because it's not processed. It's not over, over processed. And when fibers are processed, it literally takes the life out of them and it changes the actual structure from, um, it, it, it's, it changes the configuration and structure based on the way that it's pulled and the chemicals that are added. And so um, you have to, that's why they are so malleable commercial yarns. And that's not really, I mean, that's not what I, I love sheep. And so, you know, it can, it's just a natural then progression that would make me love the wool that comes from them. And then it makes me sad when it's completely destroyed. Look at how many different textures you have here. Like here? Yeah, oh, yeah. even here. This is, this is hair. This actually is Swaledale, so you're right, it is hair. And um, it's a primitive, it's a primitive breed, but it, they normally don't pick up dye very well. And so that's another thing that I teach in my class because the one, one thing that's really important to me is the canvas. And it's one of the Reading Method ten tenants and I say you have to know your canvas. And so you have to have a different way of dyeing things uh, to address the different canvases because you can never expect something like this to have the luster and the shine um, that something like this has mm -hmm. because it's a different type of fiber. And you know, it's got a really high micron. It really, it's really, it's very scratchy, but it's still in itself, if you tried to make it what it didn't want to be, if you wanted to spin it into like, let's say a, a worsted yarn, it would be like fishing line. It would be super strong, but you could never wear it, yeah. you know? Um, you know, you just have to, so, so my thing is I used to only like uh, long wools that, you know, had tons of luster and I've learned to really appreciate other other types of fiber too because I mean it's it would be like expecting my husband to be an extrovert you know what if, you, if you're he can't be an extrovert you can't make something like this behave like merino there's no crimp there's no crimp in this it doesn't have any elasticity you can just look at it and know it's straight without crimp it you know it's it's lot it's gonna have, have less elasticity so, but it's just, I don't know, my whole thing, you know, my, my biggest thing right now is, is in, in my business is, is dyeing and teaching people dyeing. And then, of course, um, you know, using the dyeing um, for like the scrap boxes. But that's how I became a great, great dyer is because I was dyeing thousands of pounds of wool, raw wool a year and all different breeds, not just like one breed. And that really made me start seeing these, these common threads that like these wools don't all behave the same. They don't pick up dye the same and some will rob the dye pot of the dye and so if you make you know and every one of my pots is going to be multiple fi fiber pots you know I have to be aware of what my canvas is in there otherwise the other the other fibers can't compete for the dye. Do you have a finished scrap box that we can um, see? Yeah actually I'll just grab it. Let me shut this because that rooster is on. Um, it's usually peacocks on the top of the they're on the roof like walking and then it's like sounds like huh. a horror movie actually. Um, like this one, this one I really like. And I call this one Habu Shabu. That hardest thing for me is coming up with names because quite frankly, that, that, that's not, I'm not into that. Like I just want to name it like olive, purple, and yellow. Like that's what I want to name it. But people are, you know, pe some people, I, you know, really into naming things. And after like the 84th one, you start running out of names. I think my favorite so far has been the snapdragon and the hummingbird. Uh, hummingbird's amazing. Yeah, it, the colors in it just don't poke your eye out. So this one, so yeah, so then, so you get in here, this, um, it has usually like um, silk, it'll have some silk, and this one has these, it'll have these, it has these beads mm -hmm. that are pretty cool. Let me take them out there. They, they look like tulips, or like, um, what are they called, like trumpet vines? Uh -huh. Uh, trumpet vines and then they, there's these other ones and then there's like silk pieces and um it's this is silk um uh, uh sliver and here is silk fabric and then this is um the reason it's called habu shabu is because this is habu yarns and habu yarns are extremely premium and they're it's a japanese company and so um and they look like little caterpillars see that's what i love that i love those they're so cute yeah, and then of course there's, you know, usually there's gonna be like a uh, mohair or long wool. If you're lucky, you'll get some vegetation, just kidding. 
Um, but yeah, see, and this is like dyed in an iridescent fashion, which is a technique that takes a little bit of work, but they're obviously really lustrous. Look at, you can see the shine. That's my favorite part. When I see this, it makes my heart happy. Yeah. I get super excited. But so yeah, so this is a scrap box and this is what someone would get and they'd usually be able to, um, this is usually about five ounces mm -hmm. and sometimes it's more, if there's no beads in it, it's usually six ounces. Um, but, um, the beads, you know, or I try, I never put cheap things. I just, well, I have this standard, um, probably because of also just, um, that's the kind of person I am. I think that quality, you have to pay more for quality and that's. Is it crazy? This is wool. And how long have you been doing this? This um, particular art? This particular, um, probably a month. Not very long. Once you're an expert in one area, it's really easy to go into other areas. But um, this is gonna be my new, my new thing that I teach people. And it's gonna be really easy because most of the people, it's funny because I have a really uh, very solid following. And once they like you and they believe in you and they know that you're gonna, you're gonna deliver, what you say you're gonna deliver. Like if I tell them I'm gonna teach them something, I'm going to teach it so incredibly well, like from the foundational principles um, and history all the way through the practical aspects, not just theory. And I think that there's this thing where um, that especially in fiber arts, you can't make it all science and you can't make it all artistry because neither is correct. It has to be this blending. You have to use the scientific aspects of how wool were, is and then you have to combine that with artistry because if if it's just all science then it doesn't matter in terms of um of wearable art it doesn't matter it is art and all of us want to say we're artists but to say something is complete artistry also i think is really reductive and what that says is i have no control and i just want to make what i want to make and um and not have to repeat it and that, that, what that is, is called, that's like happy accidents. That's not art, like, and there's nothing wrong with happy accidents, but you can't build a business on happy accidents. You, you know, especially because knitters, you know, they want, they don't want just 40 yards of one thing. They want to know what, you know, they want to know what the gauge is and they want to be able to have more than one. And so to make it a legitimate business, then you have to have this, 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 um, you have to have purpose. And once again, like, it's not to say that people that just do, you know, have happy accidents and just, you know, make whatever they make and make one skein of it. If that's not, that that's not um, legitimate, it's legitimate, but it can never be a very good business model. Because I, I got, I became really well known early on for making yarns for a co company at the time that was the biggest online yarn company called Yarn Market. And they gave me a break. See, everybody in life needs, you need everybody needs a break and I happened to I worked for the break because I would not stop every day I promised myself I was going to do something to to become more visible or, um, or just to catch a break so I would write people whether it was magazines or whatever and so yarn market I wrote yarn market and sent them for free a bunch of my handsome yarns and they were like oh we see dollar signs and they were like we totally want you and the thing was I probably wasn't even ready to make yarns like at that level um, I probably wasn't good enough but doing it made me good enough right so I tell people, life and business are like when, like when someone says, you know, when would be a great time to have a baby? Well, there's never a good time. So you have to seize the moment and take it, even if you're not ready, and become ready. And because um, if you wait until you are ready, you will just be waiting and waiting and waiting. And that's, you know, and that's, I, I am a very impatient person. I, there's, you know, I would never wait for opportunity. I'm going to make it happen. And I have had some lucky breaks for sure, but the lucky breaks and the opportunities were there because I worked for those, those, those opportunities. Yeah. Make opportunity by making, making so many connections. And I talk about that relate. It's all, everything is about relationship building in business. And, um, so every time I would contact someone that would, I'm trying to build a relationship. So they will either reject me or they will, you know, write me back and I will be my best self, my most authentic and best self and try and, and, and make that relationship become opportunity. Yeah. And for them and me, not just for me, because I mean, then, then you'd just be a narcissist if it's all about you, but it's like mutually, but every trans, every transaction has to be mutually beneficial. And the way I do business is I always want to feel like they got the better end of the deal. And I don't, I think that that is such a smart, like I just, I, someone, I heard that somewhere, um, probably 30 years ago and it made sense to me then and it makes sense to me now. And I, I feel like that's how I try to do business. 
and I think that it's one that a lot of people, most people should adopt because I, I also say that, you know, people like to try to pretend like their, their business isn't a business, that it's just a hobby and that's a really huge cop out because the second that money tr makes any sort of um, exchange for something, even if it's one time, you now are in a business. And so to hide behind that it's a hobby, it's not, you know, this person was so mean to me, they didn't like my stuff, and it's just, it's only my hobby. It's like, that's wrong. You have to, the second you're putting something out for sale, they have every right to like it or not like it, and um, you have to treat it like a business. And people actually pay it, and they, they buy, they, they, I, I hide this stuff because I don't let any, not just anybody, not anybody gets to buy this, but um, only like people that I or have been long time customers of mine. Let's see if I can find a good. Yeah, this is this is not super long, but it's pretty. But this is like just shorn off the. Sh this is what this is is it is shorn right off the sheep and then put in rainwater. Rainwater to to like rinse you know all the you know surface dirt out mm -hmm. and then it's just but it's still so it's not really I call it show it's like show rinsed that's the name of it show rinsed.